Jewish theology holds to a strictly monotheistic faith. That is, faith in only one God. Both Deuteronomy 6.4 and Exodus 20, two bedrock passages of Jewish life, begin with a strong affirmation of their monotheism. However, Christians claim that Jesus is God, yet Jesus, the Son of God, is distinguishable from God the Father. How can God the Father and Jesus the Son be one God? This is a challenge for Christianity because the same Jewish text which teaches monotheism is a part of Christian scripture. Early Christians were Jews and they saw Jesus as their Messiah. Various solutions to this question were developed by the early church, but only after a tremendous amount of effort and volumes of written material. Even today, we still wrestle with this question. Wouldn't it be more reasonable to believe that Christians simply got it wrong? In light of this challenge, it may seem reasonable to reject Christianity, but if it's true that Christians were so obviously out of line with their Jewish predecessors, we are faced with a different issue. Of all the challenges tackled by the New Testament authors, why did they spend practically no time reassessing Jewish monotheism? Why don't we have a text from Paul or Peter saying, hey everyone, I know that the scriptures teach monotheism and I know that we're getting a lot of criticism from the Jews about this because we believe Jesus is also God, so let me help you out. Other challenges to Jewish thought were discussed, such as the inclusion of the Gentiles, the messianic fulfillment of prophecy, the switch from the old covenant to the new covenant, and why the Messiah had to suffer. All of these would be examples of how Christian theology challenges the paradigm of first century Jews. It's no wonder these subjects are talked about by first century Christians trying to make sense of their Jewish roots and trying to win over their fellow Jews. If the divinity of Christ threatens monotheism, the very soul of Jewish faith and practice, and if the authors who defended Christianity against their Jewish opponents affirmed the deity of Christ, why are they virtually silent here? It's clear enough that the New Testament authors argued that Jesus was God, but they don't spend much time explaining how this could be. What if the claim that Jesus is God was less of a challenge to monotheism than we realize? Some scholars have proposed that the deity of Christ snuck its way in over several centuries. They often look to angelic or heavenly figures in the Jewish scriptures, suggesting that Jesus was originally given that kind of status, just a high angel or demigod of some sort, but not actually God. But that view eventually gave way to the view that Jesus was fully God. It was like a stepping stone to eventual recognition of the deity of Jesus. The challenge with this view is that, well, first, the full deity of Christ is affirmed far too early for it to have evolved over time from lesser God to fully God. The earliest Christian writings we have, the writings of Paul, already fully affirm that Jesus was God. Second, the stepping stone of intermediary angelic figures is still too far of a step to full deity. Jews have always maintained the distinction between God and other high up heavenly figures. Having come from the same theological convictions, the early Christian Jews would likewise have kept heavenly creatures in their place, utterly separate from the transcendent creator God who alone deserves their worship. The uh, solution to all of our problems, I think, is found in a groundbreaking work by Cambridge scholar Richard Bauckham. In 1998, Bauckham published a small book titled God Crucified, Monotheism and Christology in the New Testament, which later became chapter one in his larger book, Jesus and the God of Israel. Bauckham proposed somewhat of a striking thesis that the deity of Christ was already possible in the way that first century Jews understood their own monotheism. What has been lacking in the whole discussion of this issue, writes Bauckham, has been inadequate understanding of the ways in which Second Temple Judaism understood the uniqueness of God. If you fancy a nice, dense theological read, I highly encourage you to pick up Bauckham's book, but if you're looking for a simplified summary of this argument, let me break it down here the best I can. Bauckham shifts our focus on what the divinity of God meant for the Jewish people. Rather than seeing divinity as an essence or nature of God, the first century Jews viewed God's divinity in terms of God's identity. Put differently, rather than asking, what is divinity? 
as a way to understand God, the Jews were asking, who is this divine God? which would consequently inform what it means to be uniquely divine. Bakum argues that according to early Jewish thinking, God is identified as divine because of his unique, one-of-a-kind relationship to the world. Two of the most salient relations between God and this world are that God is the creator of all things and sovereign ruler of all things. They are features of his identity that God alone lays claim to. Only God created the world. Only God has sovereign authority over all things. Only God is the one to be worshipped. Only God. That's Jewish monotheism. When God's divinity and his oneness are understood in terms of his unique identity in relation to the world, we can understand how any aspect of God's identity helps to inform monotheism rather than threaten monotheism. Bakum points out that the Jews understood that God's word, God's wisdom, and God's spirit did things that only God does, but this was no concern for them because each is part of who God is. For example, 2 Enoch 33.4, though not Jewish scripture, but giving insight into Jewish thought, it says that God had no one to advise him in his work of creation, but that wisdom was his advisor. This is no contradiction. God's wisdom is simply part of who God is. Similarly, Psalm 33, 6 says that all things were made by the word of God. Was it the word of God rather than God himself? No, because the word of God is God himself. Bakum explains this further by saying in a variety of ways that the wisdom of God, the word of God, etc. express God, his mind and his will in relation to the world. They are not created beings, nor are they semi-divine entities occupying some ambiguous status between the one God and the rest of reality. They belong to the unique divine identity. So just as God's word, wisdom, and spirit are part of God's identity as the sole creator and ruler of the universe, so also is God's son, Jesus, placed in the same status by New Testament authors as the sole creator and ruler of all things. Jesus is God in a similar way that God's wisdom is God. They share the same identity as God. According to Bakum, the understanding of Jewish monotheism, which I have proposed, will function as the hermeneutical key to understanding the way in which the New Testament texts relate Jesus Christ to the one God of Jewish monotheism. It will enable us to see that the intention of New Testament Christology throughout the texts is to include Jesus in the unique divine identity as Jewish monotheism understood it. They do this deliberately and comprehensively by using precisely those characteristics of the divine identity on which Jewish monotheism focused in characterizing God as unique. They include Jesus in the unique divine sovereignty over all things. They include him in the unique divine creation of all things. They identify him by the divine name, which names a unique divine identity, and they portray him as accorded the worship which, for Jewish monotheists, is recognition of the unique divine identity. Many examples of this Christian activity are given in Bakum's book. His point is that the New Testament authors talked about Christ in a way that acknowledged Jesus as fully divine, but did not compromise their monotheistic commitments. To be sure, what they proclaimed about Jesus was unique. Jesus was the first and only expression of the Jewish God that had taken on a fully human body. Rather than abstract expressions of God, such as his wisdom or word, we now have something physical. But this unique proclamation was nonetheless compatible with how the Jews understood monotheism. Rather than starting with the man Jesus, attributing divine attributes to him and explaining how he is one with God, the New Testament authors started with their one unique God and expanded their understanding of who God is by introducing Jesus. Novel as it was, writes Bakum, it did not require any repudiation of the monotheistic faith which the first Christians axiomatically shared with all Jews. That's why the Christians saw no need to employ verbal gymnastics to fit Jesus into a monotheistic faith. They simply spoke about Jesus in the language of monotheism. In fact, when we see things this way, we start to realize that whenever the New Testament authors talk about Jesus as being worshipped or creator or Lord of all or sovereign, etc., all of it lays claim to his deity. 
One of the most challenging paradigm shifts required with the introduction of Jesus into the identity of God is that God can no longer be understood as a single person. Rather, within God is an interpersonal relationship between Father and Son and also Holy Spirit, but that's outside the scope of this video. We may think that Christians are asking too much for such a radical innovation, casting doubt that they have maintained monotheism, by introducing Jesus into his divine identity, uh, Bauckham recognizes this challenge, but stresses that the Jews were open to the idea. He says, while human identity may be the common analogy for thinking about the divine identity, the God of Israel clearly transcends the categories of human identity. The categories are used in awareness that God transcends them. In God's unique relationship to the rest of reality as creator of all things and sovereign ruler of all things, the human analogies, indispensable as they are, clearly point to a divine identity transcendently other than human personhood. Nothing in the Second Temple Jewish understanding of divine identity contradicts the possibility of interpersonal relationship within the divine identity. But, on the other hand, there is little, if anything, that anticipates it. Our discussion does not prove that the Jewish view of God is the correct view of God or that the early Christians were correct about the identity of Christ, but it does show that the deity of Christ needn't contradict a monotheistic view of God as clearly outlined in Deuteronomy 6.4 and other scripture. Why should we care? Well, Many modern-day religious Jews and Muslims argue that Christianity's view of Christ is not compatible with their own Old Testament. But instead of reevaluating the deity of Christ, perhaps we need to reevaluate who God truly is in light of who Christ is, the supreme unique creator and sovereign ruler of all the universe, unlimited in power and splendor, compelled by love to come down from his throne as the suffering servant who died for our sins. This content is also in blog post format, so if you want to share this video, you have options. Link is in the description. Anyway, uh, next week I am interviewing a friend of mine who has this crazy story of coming to faith in Christ. It is wild. It is also my first time ever doing an interview here on YouTube, so that will be fun. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.